All right, friends, so what I'm going to show you today is that a lot of these more modern-day Bible translations, such as the NIV, NASB, ESV, CSB, NLT, LSB, have straight up adulterated the Word of God. Now, it doesn't mean that if you happen to read these translations that you're necessarily automatically going to hell or anything like that. Listen, I believe God can speak through any of these translations. I've had God speak to me through translations like the NLT, ESV, so I'm not saying that at all, but what I am saying is that these translators have willfully, flagrantly, knowingly adulterated the Word of God, straight up adulterated the Word of God. I wanted to show you here in 1 Timothy 6.19 how they take a word out here because it conflicts with their theology. They take a word out and give it a completely different meaning that's foreign to the text. It's, this isn't translated like this in any other, uh, any other time this word is used, as I'm going to prove to you, and it's not what it means in the Greek. They take this word eternal out of the Bible, and they give it a completely new meaning. That's completely foreign to Scripture. And you can see why, because Paul is talking about rich people, and he's telling them that they must do good, let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, and listen to this, that they may lay hold on eternal life. So what Paul's saying here is they have to continue doing good in order to reap eternal life, like it talks about in places like Galatians 6 and other places. But as you can see, this conflicts with the whole narrative of faith alone, eternal security, because you're because Paul is very clearly saying that you have to, yes, do something in order to inherit eternal life or to lay hold of eternal life. So what they do is they straight up adulterate God's word by taking the word eternal out here and making it say something like truly life, you know, to make it sound not so much like it's talking about salvation, to make it sound more like it's talking about uh, maybe just having a full life, or, or maybe a more complete life, or maybe like Jesus said, that he's come, that, that uh, he may give life to the fullest, that we can have life to the fullest. You know, just a more fuller life, or a better life. Friends, that's not at all what this is saying. I'm going to prove to you that they straight up adulterated the Word of God. Now, in the New King James and the King James Version, they leave this as eternal life, but let's go ahead and look at some of the other versions and see what they say. Um, okay, so right here, you can see New King James and the King James leave it as eternal life. That's exactly what it is. Uh, in the Greek, it's ionias, zoe, eternal life. But as we move on here to the NIV, it says that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Okay, the word truly there is found nowhere in the Greek, as I'm going to show you. Absolutely nowhere. This is completely, this isn't just a, just a mistake. This isn't an error. This isn't an accident. I'm going to show you that they willfully, they knew what they were doing. They did this intentionally. I'm going to prove that to you guys. Okay, so just listen to the whole thing before you go in the comments below and start writing, oh, you know, supporting your, your favorite translation. Just hear me out and listen to me. They did this intentionally, and I'm going to prove it to you that they did this. But NIV says truly life, even though it's not in the Greek. Uh, ESV says something similar, truly life. Again, not in the Greek. Uh, CSB, truly life. NASB 20, what's interesting is the NA, NASB 95, they, they slightly changed their interpretation of this. They used to say it meant life indeed. Where did they get that? The word indeed is found nowhere in the Greek, neither is truly. But they ended up going with the flow here, so, so to speak, and changing it to truly life with the NASB 20. Uh, we see the LSB, the one that John MacArthur is supporting and saying is one of the best Bibles out there. He translated it likewise as life Indeed. Friends, where is this in the Greek? This is found absolutely nowhere in the Greek. It conflicts with their narrative of faith alone. Uh, the NET says truly life, RSV, life indeed. Here we go again, ASV, life indeed. Uh, now the wild, the Young's literal translation, it translates it pretty closely. It says life, age, enduring, because that's what it is, eternal life. Um these other translations, you can look at them, but NLT says that they may experience true life. Um, 
web translations that they may lay hold on eternal life. Okay, so this is one of the few that actually translates it as eternal life. Um, and then we have, let me see. Okay, that's all we're going to go through. But let's let's look and see in the Greek what this actually means. Okay, uh, let's look at this. Let's look at the interlinear here and go through. Okay, this word ionias, right here. It's ionias zoe. It means eternal life. That's what it means. And if we click on it here, it's G166. Let's see how this is translated. Nowhere in the entire Bible is this translated as truly. Nowhere. Or indeed. Okay, we see right here. It means eternal, everlasting. The world began since the world began forever. It, it means just that. It means eternal, everlasting, forever. That's what it means. Nowhere do we see that it's translated as truly or indeed. That, that's simply just a completely different word. They took the word eternal out of it completely. Okay, this, this wasn't just a mistake. They took it out completely and replaced it with a completely different word to support their doctrine. And if you don't believe me, let's look and see how this is used. This is used when Jesus was talking about uh, that if you don't cut off your hand, you'll be thrown into the everlasting fire. That's how it's translated, everlasting. Uh, when someone asked him, what, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? It wasn't saying true life. No, it's translated as eternal. See, every, every place we look, um, I believe it's 71 times this is translated as eternal, everlasting, uh, this sort of thing, never as truly or indeed. We see that the right, uh, these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Um, just all throughout here, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Um, it just goes on and on. Unrighteous mammon, uh, that they may receive you into an everlasting home. It talks about eternal kingdom, everlasting home, everlasting life, everlasting fire, and so on and so forth. So if you just go through and look this up, never does this word ionias mean anything similar, anything close to truly life. See, they want you to believe that instead of it talking about salvation, no, no, it can't be talking about that you need to do good in order to have everlasting life. No, no, it can't possibly mean that. So they're going to try to soften it some and make you think that it's just simply talking about having maybe a better life or, you know, maybe just a more fulfilling life or like Jesus said, that he came that you may have life to the fullest. Um, something like that, that just that your life may be full, more complete, that your life may be more satisfying, and anything else other than eternal life. But friends, what they're doing here is straight up adulterating the Word of God. There's no excuse for this. In case you're going to say that this is an accident or maybe uh, just an error, well, first of all, let's, let's go back and look. Uh, in 1 Timothy 6, chapter 6 alone, they translated this word. This word eternal appears three times in just in chapter 6 alone, just in that chapter. Okay, let's look at this. We see in verse 19, we have it, but if we just back up a few verses, back up to verse 12, check this out. Paul says, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life. Right here, this is the same word, ionias, zoe, eternal life. But yet, if you look through all the translations, every single one of them that I look through, that I remember, translates it as eternal life. But for some reason, when we get right down here to verse 19, all of a sudden, it's not eternal life. It's the same exact word in the Greek. In fact, even the same terminology, it says that they may lay hold. It's that same exact word in the Greek. In fact, we can check it out. Okay, the same word. In the Greek, okay, that they may that they may lay hold on. It's G nineteen forty nine. Let's look at it, and guess what? It's found in both First Timothy, First Timothy six twelve. See right there for lay hold on eternal life, and also six nineteen, that they may lay hold on eternal life. So it's exact same phrasing in the Greek, but for some reason it's translated two totally separate ways. Now, why is that? Why, why would they translate it a completely different way in the same exact chapter? 
Why would they do that? And also, this word eternal appears in verse 16 as well, when it says, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, um, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. See, that's that same word, ionios. Right here, they translate it as everlasting or eternal. And in every translation that I remember looking through, they translate it as everlasting or eternal. But for some reason, when we get down here to verse 19, when Paul's saying that the rich need to do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, that they may lay hold on eternal life, for some reason, no, 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 let's switch that. That can't mean eternal life because that sounds too much like works. That sounds like the rich actually have to, yes, do something in order to lay hold of eternal life. So what they do is they swap this word eternal out with something completely different. Okay, you, you can go check this out for yourself. You can do the research. Please do the research on this. Please look it up and see if there's any possible excuse for them doing this. There's, there's no excuse. This is, as far as I'm concerned, this is willful, flagrant, adultering, adulterating of the scriptures. That's what they're doing. They know exactly what they're doing. They knew that this word eternal can't be translated. Nowhere is it translated as truly. It's just simply not. Nowhere is it translated as indeed, like the LSB wants you to believe. No, this is is completely just, they just made this up. It's not in the Greek, guys. Look up the Greek for yourself, you won't find it. So the question is, why would they do this? Well, let's just look and see what the Bible actually says, because the Bible tells us, in case you're going to say, well, you know, it's not by works and all this, well, listen, this is very clear throughout Scripture. Jesus himself said, do not marvel at this, right? He said, do not marvel at this in John 5, for the hour is coming in which all who were in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, zoe, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. All throughout the Bible, we see that we're going to be judged by our works. This isn't anything new, guys. This is found throughout Scripture. And in Romans 2.5, we see something very similar. When Paul was saying that they need to be rich in good works, uh, ready to share, ready to give, so that they may lay hold on eternal life, we see something very similar in Romans 2. Paul says, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are storing up or you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life, that's Ionios Zoe, to those who by patient continuance, and yes, doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man, who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good. Do you see that? To the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there's no partiality with God. He's saying this applies to everybody, whether you're Jew or Greek, everybody. And this isn't the only place. In Galatians 6, we see Paul saying that you have to, yes, do good, keep sowing to the Spirit and doing good in order to reap everlasting life. Ionias Zoe. Paul says, do not be deceived. He even says, don't be deceived on this, guys. God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are of the household of faith especially to those who are of the household of faith. Uh, we also see in 2 Peter, Paul saying that we need to give all diligence to add to our faith things like knowledge and godliness and, and love and brotherly kindness. And by doing this, we're going to be supplied, uh, for an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Everlasting. Ionias. See, That's how an entrance will be abundantly supplied to us, is by giving all diligence to add to our faith. See, this is consistent throughout Scripture. This is why 
they want to adulterate and pervert the Word of God by taking the word eternal out there. So it just seems like, well, you know, maybe it could just be talking about uh, just, just having a fuller life, a more satisfying life, a more complete life. No, this is talking about eternal judgment. If you don't do good, you're going to reap eternal judgment. You're not going to reap everlasting life. This is what the Bible says. Over and over again, the Bible says you're going to be judged by your works. Jesus said this. He said, do not lay up for yourselves. So that word that Paul used, he said, uh, laying up for yourselves. So he said uh, that you may lay up for yourself, or that you may lay up um, eternal life. We can go back to that. Uh, He says, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come. So this storing up for yourselves, that, that you may lay hold on eternal life. This is related to this word right here. When Jesus said, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then he says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. See, this is very clear. Remember the rich young ruler, he sent away sad because he didn't want to give up his possessions. He went away sad. He didn't inherit eternal life. And that's what he was asking. He said, you know, what do I... what?" What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Ionios Zoe. What do I need to do to enter the everlasting kingdom? And that's what he told him. He said that he needed to give up all of his goods, sell, sell them and give to the poor, and then come follow him. See, he needed to, yes, do something. This is consistent throughout Scripture. A lot of the false teachers will say, well, no, Jesus didn't really mean that. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. So let's go back to this now. Now, Seriously, why why would they flagrantly, just so willfully, just say, well, eternal, that doesn't really mean that. Um, eternal means something totally different. It means, it means uh, something like indeed, yeah, uh, that you may lay hold of life indeed, or something like that. See, it, it really softens the blow. It really softens the, the intent of this to cut to the heart, to say, no, this is for salvation. Listen, you rich people out there, you can't serve both God and money. Just like Jesus said, this is very consistent. Just like the rich young ruler, you can't have an idol in your heart of money and expect to inherit the eternal kingdom, expect to inherit eternal life. No, it's not going to work. See, this is what Paul was saying. This is why they try to adulterate and pervert the Word of God to hide this truth. This is just one way, but this right here is, is evidence alone, is, is condemning right here that they take out of the Word of God. I mean, just think about just think about the mindset. For those of you who, who might be saying that this really isn't that big of a deal, think about if you did this to any other verse in the Bible. If you just completely and utterly destroyed the meaning of a verse and made it say something completely different to change the meaning of a verse. I, I mean, think about if you did this to any other verse. Think about it. What if you did this to John 3.16, and you made eternal say something, just whatever you wanted? Or, or um, you know, everlasting, or just whatever. What if you just took that, took a word out, and just made it say whatever you wanted? That's what they're doing here. They have no scriptural grounds to do this to make the word eternal here say truly or indeed, like many of these modern day translations want to have you believe. They just pulled this out of thin air, guys. This is not in the Greek. Look it up for yourselves in case you're still saying that you don't believe me or whatever, do the research yourself, look this up yourself, and if you can prove that they did this willfully, one time, that's all that's needed. See, I don't need to go through all these different verses. This alone is enough. And in case you're going to say, well, okay, but it's just one example. But look at this. Look, three times, and in fact, four times everlasting is is brought up. Paul brings it up in, in 1 Timothy. Four times. And each time it's translated as something like everlasting or eternal. But why just in verse 19 is it all of a sudden switched to mean truly life or indeed? Just think about that. Why would they do that? See, they knew what the definition meant. I mean, obviously. I mean, so how many times they go through translating this and then all of a sudden they get to this one verse and they say, oh, well, it actually doesn't mean that. It means something totally different. Again, I can show you there is absolutely no 
grounds for this. This word, aeonias, okay, right here, it means eternal. It means everlasting. There's no way around this. It means right here, without beginning and end, that which always has been and always will be, without beginning, without end, never to cease, everlasting. Where do you see anywhere in here anything about it just meaning truly? See, they just they just added that word in there. And what does the Bible say about those who who take away from the Word of God, add to it? Remember Proverbs, it talks about, uh, do not add to God's words, lest, you, lest God rebuke you and you be found a liar. That's what these men are. They're liars. They're straight-up liars. This is no small thing. Think about it. Again, what if I did this to a verse, like let's say, uh, any verse that you hold near and dear? Let's say we took a verse and then straight up gave it a completely different meaning and had no scriptural grounds for it whatsoever. Again, if, if you don't, if you want to come against me, find scriptural grounds for turning this word ionias to mean truly or indeed. Please find me the scriptural grounds for this because, again, why would they translate eternal as eternal or everlasting? And every single time in Timothy, and then all of a sudden, for this one, translated as something completely different that has no backing whatsoever. Guys, this is incredibly condemning. I mean, just, just think about just think about the the gall of these people to do this. I mean, think about how they had to have known. They knew what the word eternal meant. They knew good and well what eternal meant. They know what Ionios means. And yet they specifically chose not to interpret it that way, not to translate it that way. But instead, they picked a word out of thin air, out of complete thin air, and just inserted that into the text. So they take the word eternal out of the text. And not only that, but then they add a word they think should be in there. This isn't, this is not translating, guys. This is straight up adulterating the word of God. That's what it is. It's twist, it's it's perverting. It's not even twisting. It's it's just perverting the word of God. You're taking words out of it. You're taking at least one word out of it and putting it in. And not only that, but it gives it a completely different meaning. See, you could just interpret that. Well, just, you know, life indeed. Well, that could just mean like life in the sense of just having having a, a, a good spiritual life or just having a sense of completeness or fullness or, or something like that, you see? But when you have eternal life, there's a, certain, there's a certain seriousness that comes along with that, or there should be. Now, some people don't care. Some people, like, um, I had Rob Solberg on, and we went through Galatians 6, and he didn't care at all. He, he didn't care that Galatians 6 said that you have to do good in order to reap eternal life. No, he just said, well, eternal life doesn't really mean that. Uh, yeah, and, and it doesn't mean that you're going to reap eternal life. And I mean, guys, you can check out that video. I can post that down below. Um, also, what I'm going to do is I'm going to post down below a video that talks about how Christians are going to be judged. This is important. I mean, we need to know how we're going to be judged. When we stand before Jesus, are you going to, like the false teachers, say, well, you know, I simply just trusted in the finished work of the cross, and that's why that's why I should be allowed in. Is this found anywhere in Scripture, that he's going to ask you if you trusted in the finished work of the cross and that's it? Is, is this found anywhere in Scripture? No. No, it's not, friends. If we look and see, if we go through every example where the judgment is brought up, never once, not once do we see anything about asking him asking us if we trust in the finished work of the cross or if we, or if we just had faith alone. None of this. Every single time, Matthew 25, we're going to be judged based on what we did to the, um, the naked, the poor, the hungry, the thirsty, the imprisoned. That's what we're going to be judged by. You know, yes, what we actually did, not by our faith alone, no, by our actions, by our deeds. And that's what Paul is saying here. Um, let's just look at it again. This is why people want to pervert this and adulterate this. Paul says, let me just back up to verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present age. Okay, right here. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty. Okay, so this is what they need to do. Not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, 
but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. And this is what it looks like to trust in him, in case you're going to say, ah, oh, right there, all we got to do is trust and have faith alone. That's, that's not what it says. This is what it looks like to trust in the living God, right here. Let them do good. See, yes, do something, not just believe something, but do something. That they be rich in good works, okay? Ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. A lot of these modern day Bible translations want to pervert this verse so that you don't really get the full brunt of what this is saying. Yeah, so if you have if you have money, this is and and many in the West do compared, especially compared to rest the rest of the world, this is what you need to do. You need to not be haughty nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. And this is what that looks like: doing good, being rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. And it's in doing this that you're going to lay up or lay hold on eternal life. Do you see that? Please check out those videos. This is absolutely crucial how we're going to be judged. You need to be ready. Like Jesus said, so many times in the parables, he said, he talks about being ready, have your lamps burning. Well, what does it look like to be ready? Are you going to be that servant that's found not doing the master's will and going to be cut to pieces? Or are you going to be found doing the will of God? Yes, not just believing, but doing the will of God. It's up to you guys. Please check out the, that video that I'm going to post down below, and let me know your thoughts on this. Again, I'm not saying that if you read these pat, these translations that you're automatically necessarily going to hell or anything like that. God still speaks through these, okay? He, he's spoken to me through some of these translations, so I'm not saying that, but these translators, there's no way around it. They willfully, knowingly, flagrantly adulterated the Word of God. If you think I'm wrong, then write down the comments and show me otherwise. Again, dealing with this verse, how they translated eternal to mean something like truly or indeed, when they have no scriptural basis for this. Let me know your thoughts down below. That's all I got for today. God bless.